a small number of people with Parkinson's disease, people who are newly diagnosed, people who had been on leave it open for a while, and people who are maybe had, had Parkinson's for a longer period of time to see if there were any problems with switching from brand name Cinemet to <clears throat> generic uh, carbidopa levodopa, and they didn't really find any issues in that small group of, of patients. They did do another study looking at 86 patients to see if there might be any uh, problems going between generic and, and brand name uh, carbidopa levodopa, and they found in their small study, which was published actually quite a while ago now, in 1994, that and this was done in an open label fashion, not blinded to the investigators or to the uh, people with Parkinson's disease, that uh, about two thirds or 70% uh, didn't really see a big difference. And in fact, they either uh, preferred the generic or did not have any difficulty or did not have any preference one over the other. But there was a group of people who were having more trouble with Parkinson's disease. They were having difficulty with more off periods during the day. They might have some dose failures, meaning they would take the medication and it didn't seem to work. Or they had what's called orthostatic hypotension. They had low blood pressure when they would stand up. And that group of people did have more difficulty in that, in that kind of change from going from brand name to generic or vice versa. There was an interesting study done some years ago, not in Parkinson's disease, but in epilepsy, looking at an anti seizure medication called topiramate or Topamax is the brand name. And that was done in 2009. And they did find some difficulties, but the difficulties were not really with a generic specifically. It was patients who were treated with that medication for epilepsy who kept switching different generic brands. And in that particular study, they did have difficulty. Patients were having more problems with apparently uh, uh, inadequate control of their seizures. So they would had more hospitalizations, they tend to stay longer in the hospital and sustain more injuries. In that same study, they found if somebody was just on one generic and stuck with that generic brand, that they didn't really have the problems compared to the branded to uh, Topamax uh, medications. So the problems seem to arise from switching from one generic company to another. The FDA does allow a little bit of variability in terms of how much medication is delivered. And that could conceivably be a problem if people are using a generic Parkinson's medication. And then the pharmacy is switching from one brand to another. And that's really hard to know because often the pills are the same color, they're the same shape, they're round, they're yellow. For example, unless you know and look or look at the bottle where they probably do say who the manufacturer was, then you may not know that you're being changed from one to another. And there could be, you know, plus or minus in one direction or another, uh, a total of 20% in terms of the availability of the medication. And that is, I think, where the problem could arise in somebody with Parkinson's disease, particularly somebody who's taking several pills a day, maybe has had the, had the uh, diagnosis and treatment for a number of years, you know, that could be problematic in terms of the pharmacy switching the generic brands. The other issue, which is really not a generic issue, but is an insurance issue, is that insurance companies, they're not, you know, they often like to uh, use generic medications. I, I use generic medications. If I buy Tylenol in the grocery store, I don't buy Tylenol, I buy acetaminophen, the generic formulation of that medication, because it's cheaper. And it does have, you know, offer a huge savings for everyone, for patients, for insurance plans and so forth to use uh, generic medications. So I think there's validity to that uh, using generic medications. But the issue sometimes arises where the insurance company will say, well, I'm prescribing drug X and they want to say, well, you can't use, why don't you try, try drug Y or Z instead? But it's not the same thing. It's not the same medication. Um, you know, I may prescribe a dopamine agonist like Premipexol, and they would say, well, no, you have to use amantadine instead. Uh, Try that first for somebody who's having motor fluctuations. And that is not the same at all. That's not a generic substitution. That's a drug uh, substitution. That becomes a problem. And I, you know, I don't want to point fingers or lay blame because we're all in this together, there are only so many dollars in the universe. 
to cover uh, healthcare costs, and we all want to be sensitive about these these kinds of issues. But it it becomes problematic for me when a an insurance company is is trying to direct care. They have protocols, they have their formularies of things that they may provide in certain tiers and so forth. And I struggle with that really on a daily basis where I'm getting feedback. I'm recommending a certain treatment regimen, whether it's Parkinson's or migraine or something else. And I'm getting a pushback from an insurer saying, well, no, we don't cover this. You have to try that other medication first. That, that does become problematic. And I think these issues, you know, insurance companies, and I, I get they, everybody has to be sensitive about costs in terms of healthcare. I certainly am. Uh, but insurance companies sometimes have a, they have guidelines for care. And I'm not sure that these guidelines say for Parkinson's disease are developed by people who have expertise in Parkinson's disease. They may be general neurologists. Uh, they may not be. And, and I don't know any of my colleagues, for example, in uh, movement disorders who, who have served on any of these uh, guideline developments for insurance companies. So I'm not sure where they're coming from. Another example along the same line is that I will order tests sometimes. I request uh, MRI scans of the brain for certain situations. And I also get pushback from insurance companies about, well, it doesn't meet our guidelines. And I was talking to somebody with the insurance company. It was actually a physician who was reviewing the MRI that I requested, and they were denying it, saying it didn't meet their guidelines. And I was talking to the physician at the insurance uh, company who was saying it didn't meet their guidelines. And I asked, well, what is your specialty? And they were a specialist in, in maternal and fetal medicine. They were not a neurologist uh, at all and didn't probably have any experience with neurology. So that kind of situation is, of course, frustrating to those of us who are you know, trying to provide the best care that we can. I, I should say, and then we can take, take some questions or comments, that when, when I'm coming up with a, a medication regimen that I think would be best for my patient, I, I think of several factors. I think about, well, what is the best choice in terms of addressing their symptoms? What is the medication that I think will do, will serve them most efficiently or effectively? I think about side effects uh, and for the individual, uh, and that can change my thinking about how side effects may be tolerated by certain people will depend on their situation. I think about the frequency of dosing. Uh, all of you who are coping with Parkinson's understand very well the you know, sometimes the, the medication regimens that almost seem to be impossible to adhere to. Even my patients who are taking a, a pill just three times a day will often have difficulty getting all three doses in. So I have to think about these issues. Is this realistic for my patient? Uh, and I also think about cost issues. Um, uh, all of us are sensitive to this. I saw a patient yesterday who does not have Parkinson's disease, but she was being, was recommended to her that she have a test, not by me, but by another one of her doctors. And it was going to cost her $100. And she said, I don't have that $100. <clears throat> That's not an insignificant amount of money to lots and lots of people. So I, ha I think about all these things. Uh, the what is, what is the best choice in terms of uh, the medication? What are the po possible side effects that can be troubling? Is the dosing regimen going to be realistic? And this person who's already on other medications keep up with that? And I think about cost issues, cost to the patient, cost to the universe, cost to the insurance company, cost to our society, about how these things uh, pan out. So it's, it's not just, oh, you have this symptom, take this medication. I, ha I have all these things running through my mind while I'm trying to come up with a medication regimen that I think will be the best fit. It pretty much covers what I had to say, other than I, I'm not in opposition, in opposition to generics at all. Uh, I, I think they, they, are, they do offer a cost savings to patients, to our society in many respects. Uh, so I'm, I think it is probably a reasonable thing for most people to take generic medications, particularly levodopa, but particularly when, when things are not terribly complicated in terms of the management of their Parkinson's symptoms. But there are exceptions to that. 
So I'm happy to hear any thoughts or uh, questions okay. from people who are listening in. Great, thank you for that. So we will, uh, we have a couple of questions from the chat and I wanted to make sure I understood everything. Uh, so a generic drug, so ideally um, they are all, they can all be considered equivalent, no matter which manufacturer is making it you know, ideally it should, they should all be equivalent. And this goes into a question that Dorothy had, um, because there is a difference in the amount of drug available in a pill and the bioavailability of the drug is that, does that actually mean that they are not all equivalent? And like you mentioned, um, you know, different manufacturers, you can look at your pill bottle, it's not all the same. Um, is that specific to Parkinson's drugs or all drugs? And I don't know, could you comment on that? It's all drugs. Uh, and the FDA does have uh, standards, and, and I think they're fairly uh, stringent standards about generics being the same amount and the same content and being safe. So the, they're not they don't just sort of slide in uh, to our society. They are scrutinized carefully by the FDA. And by the way, I think the FDA is uh, in large a good organization. I think they put patient safety foremost uh, in terms of their uh, thinking about approving medications, including generics. But there can be some variation. And as I mentioned, I think the variation um, is problematic for somebody who may be more tightly controlled on their medication regimen. As I mentioned in that one study with people with epilepsy where they kept changing the, G the generic manufacturer and that raised problems. I think for many people with levodopa, for example, going from one company to another is probably not gonna make a big difference in terms of their symptom control. And if there is a change, then we can adjust the medication regimen if need be. Probably that's not gonna be necessary for many people, but for some it will be. For some it is problematic, and I have run into that in the past in my practice with somebody who's very tightly controlled on a medication regimen, and then the manufacturer changed, and things seem to not go as well. And is that affected the more doses or the more you take, those people might be at greater risk, or, or they would be greater affected by that kind of change? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take one more question from the chat, and in the meantime, we'll queue up. Um, we'll now allow people to unmute themselves. So if you would like to ask a question directly, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. And we're going to, uh, Rachel and I are going to be traffic control to make sure we're not all talking at the same time. So thank you all for your patience around that. Um, while everyone's lining up their questions, I have one in the chat that I'll pass along. Um, evidently, Requip will soon, if not already, be sold only as a generic. Um, so I don't know if you knew that and could talk about that in particular. Um, should people take a larger dose when moving to the generic? Have you heard of patients having less effect from a generic? I guess I would maybe bring this to the bigger question of if you know a drug that you're on is going um, to a generic, do you need to do anything? Talk to your doctor about it. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are, you know, I'm, uh, Requip, which is Ropinerol, is the generic name, has been available as a generic medication for a long time now. And I guess I'm not surprised. It was originally from a company called GlaxoSmithKline. And I guess I'm not surprised that they, I, I wasn't aware, but they may now no longer find it uh, feasible, from, probably from a financial point of view, for them to continue to manufacture a brand name. Uh, requip. I don't think most people would need to make any changes or anticipate any um, you know, rocky roads with a, a change to a generic form of Requip or for that matter most of the Parkinson's medications. Um, 
if there seemed to be some change in their symptoms, that would be a reason to discuss it with their treating uh, provider to see if there's something that they, they need to do differently. Okay. And there's a question about carbidopa, levodopa, and cinnamet, and Merck. So yeah. is carbidopa, levodopa a generic? Is cinnamet a generic or a brand, brand name? And I understand Merck doesn't manufacture cinnamet in the U.S. anymore. Um, can you talk about, you know, I, I think we hear the the brand name, the drug name, and sometimes they're used interchangeably, but maybe they actually shouldn't be. Could you clarify that a little bit? So the, the generic name is Carbidopa Levodopa. The brand name, which came from Merck, uh, is Cinemet. Uh, and that came out along like, like 1975, something like that. And I think at some point in the past, Merck and DuPont uh, got together, and I think DuPont took over the manufacturing of brand name Cinemet. Um, I understand that there was a, a lapse or a discontinuation of brand name Cinemet at some point in the past, some years ago, and then again, maybe more recently. But that, that the generic preparation is Carbidopa Levodopa. Now, there, there are some things to be aware of. There are different forms of carbidopa levodopa. There's the yellow pill, which is the most commonly uh, d used form, the uh, 25 slash 100. There are some others. There's a 25 to 50, which is a blue color usually. And there's a 10, 100. There are also extended release formulations, usually preceded by ER, extended release, or CR, control release. And there have been uh, examples, certainly in my practice, where those two were used interchangeably, and they should not be because they don't behave the same way. So I, I don't know the status for sure of brand name sentiment. I'm, I don't know that if it's available anymore or not. You know, there's there's a sort of an interesting historical note about sentiment. Uh, I don't know if people know the origin of that name. You know all these drug names, you, know, you don't know where they come from anymore there. But cinnamet comes from the Latin uh, because it's a combination of carbidopa and levodopa, levodopa being the active ingredient. Carbidopa it was figured out actually by people at Merck a long time ago, could be added to levodopa to reduce the dose and try to minimize side effects like nausea. So they combined them together to, to have this brand name of cinnamet. And cinnamet is from the Latin Sin without emit vomiting, without vomiting. That's what that medication name means. Interesting. You hear all, you see all the drug commercials and sometimes- You wonder where that, they come from, but- Yeah, you know, that one actually, you know- uh, means, means something. Means something. I think we had, uh, is it Mrs. Einhorn? I might mis mispronounce your first name, but I think you've unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. I'm okay. okay. Okay, I'll put you on mute. And what about um, Mary Edgerton? I think I saw you unmuted and perhaps had a question. Nope, okay. Then what about, um, that's always my signal when I see uh, an unmute. Um, how about Ron Stack? Did you have a question? Yes, um, I left a note on the, uh, the chat. And about two years ago, I had an adverse reaction to one of the generic manufacturers. And I just wanted everyone to know that it's possible. Yeah, it is possible because in the, the other ingredients are supposed to be always the same, but there, there may be other fillers or other things that they used to put the pill together. Uh, and it's conceivable that somebody could have a reaction to something else other than the active ingredient. So yeah, that's, that is a possibility. Uh, and again, it could be that the, the amount in that generic was a little bit higher than what you'd been accustomed to or a little bit lower than what you've been accustomed to. That could have caused some response. And Thank how you. would someone know that it's a, re, it's a reaction to the generic? I mean, I don't know, Ron, mm -hmm. if it was obvious or you go right to your doctor, but you know, Parkinson's symptoms are, are complex. Yeah, it is complex, and it, it can be challenging to figure out, is this a symptom from Parkinson's disease itself, or is this a 
problem with the medication. You know, if, it's, if it happens in close association, or you change from one brand to another, and then this happened, it makes me suspicious. But even in that setting, you have to be careful about assuming that one thing that follows another, they're necessarily connected. That's not always the case. Uh, so I think it would it require some careful thought and discussion between the provider and the, and the patient. My symptoms kick, kicked in worse um, for, for the Parkinson's. And uh, when I went back, when I was brought back to regular Cinemat or the generic from the other manufacturers, I was fine. Well, that's fairly convincing that it was an issue of the manufacturer. That, that, that particular, uh, not that their product was, was inferior, but it could be that the content in their tablet or their capsule was, was different than what you had been accustomed to. Okay, great. Uh, I think Kathy uh, unmuted herself and had a question. Do you want to go ahead, Kathy? Yeah, I was actually typing my question, and it may be similar to what the doctor just answered. But I'll go ahead and ask it in case it's a little different. And that is um, if there are five ingredients, for example, in a drug, and one of the ingredients isn't available, can there be a substitute for one of the ingredients? And if so, that would compromise the effectiveness of the drug, I presume. I don't think the FDA would allow that to happen. They would not allow that. To no, they would not allow substitution of an active ingredient with something else. That would not be acceptable. Okay, and then my second question was, you hear a lot about uh, the pharmaceutical companies kind of being, or a lot of the drugs being manufactured in China, for example. Um, can you comment on any safety issues or concerns people should have about that? Well, again, when these, when these drugs are, generics are approved by the FDA, part of their scrutiny is the packaging and preparation of the drugs. So I think it would be unlikely that that would be allowed, that, uh, that there, are sa there is safety checking, including after the, the generics are approved. Uh, there's still some monitoring of, and follow-up. So I think it's not likely that that's going to occur. Okay. And Thank Robert, you. I think are you okay? I'm good. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. I've been on Ritari since it came out. And initially, mm -hmm. I had to get approval by the physicians to write a letter saying that I could take it. Apparently, it's very expensive. Now that uh, I've gotten all that in, I was wondering when it's going to be a generic. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know exactly the date when it's going to become generic. It's not been out that long. And the reason... You know, it's, it's, a, it's a reconfiguration of an old medication, carbidopa, levodopa, but it does have some new technology. As you know, Ritari is a capsule inside that there's some beads that release carbidopa, levodopa at varying rates. And so that is a, a patent protected uh, formulation of an old medication. And how much longer it'll be on patent, I don't know for sure. So I have not heard that there's any generic for Ritari looming in the near future. Thank you. And Laura, I think, uh, did you unmute yourself to ask a question? Yes, I, I just found a paper that says that Cinemet is gonna be discontinued. The date is July 19th, 2019. Mm -hmm. So I actually work for 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 Merck in Mexico when I lived there. Oh. I did um, communications for them. Um, and I was wondering if that this is a second question, if with all the COVID um, disruption of, of, sorry, I'm being Parkinson-y today. If there's gonna be an interruption in the pro in the supply of Parkinson meds. Do you foresee that? No, I don't foresee that. I think that would be not likely to occur. Okay. And by the way, Merck was the first pharmaceutical in the world. For carbidopa levodopa. In the world ever. 
Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Back in back in the sixth, seventeenth century or something. Really? They were born in Germany, but after the World War Two, they expropriated Merck all over the world. Mm -hmm. So Merck, German Merck, is the the original brand all over the world except in the U.S. Hmm. They bought Choose back the trivia questions we have now. That's good. Jeopardy yeah. fodder, right? That we was interesting. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm just like that. <laughs> no, that was interesting. Thank you for that. I, I was curious about that. Okay. Thank you. We're learning all kinds of things today. Um, so let's see. There is a question from Mary. And I will couch this by saying, um, you know, uh, so Dr. Hermanowitz, as much as I think you know everything, you are allowed to not know everything. And Mary's question might... Uh, ask, ask my kids, <laughs> ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, so her question is, is there a standard allowable variance by the FDA for generic drugs or is it medication specific drug by drug? You know, there's the standard allowable variance. So there, there, the maximal concert, I found this on the FDA website, and I read it actually in the paper by Raj Pawa and his colleagues, that they have a allowed variation of a maximal concentration between 80 and 125%. So there is some variation. And that could, again, as I mentioned, if somebody's been treated for Parkinson's disease for some years, and like the gentleman said earlier, he changed, I think it was Requip, uh, cause some trouble. So it's conceivable that it could. Yeah. And when that sort of thing comes up, and I've done this in the past, I have uh, either called the pharmacy myself or the patient has and asked, has there been a change in their manufacturer? And from possibly from brand name to generic or from one generic manufacturer to another, which is the latter is more common. Very good. Let's see. We have a question about the recently announced generic version of Nupro, the transdermal patch, mm -hmm. um, in particular the reliability of the patch to adhere to the skin. So I guess the question, or my question would be when it's, you know, in that instance when it's uh, not just a, a pill, but the uh, patch um, how do you foresee that going to generic manufacturing being affected? Well, I, the, again, they would have to uh, provide, if not identical, close to it, uh, technology for the, the patch itself. And that's a whole different game than swallowing pills uh, or capsules. So they, a generic manufacturer would have to demonstrate again, that their delivery of medication by the transdermal skin patch method is equivalent, bioequivalent, meaning that they're getting the medication into the blood and presumably the brain in the same sort of delivery, uh, the same amount and the same approximately maximal concentration in the blood. And a sidebar question, you were in, uh you know, Irvine, and I don't know how hot and humid it gets in Santa Fe, but um, this person's in Tucson and it's sweaty. So any advice for new pro patch in uh, hot and humid situations? That, that is, uh, that it doesn't get that, it doesn't get Phoenix hot in Santa Fe. It's been hot here lately. Um, and I used to have a clinic in a town called an office in Rancho Mirage, which is the same place as Palm Springs, which does get Phoenix hot. So I would drive out there once a week and see patients. And I remember walking out, I had to leave early one day to go do something and it was 120 degrees. And I thought, man, I don't, I don't know if I can make it to my car or not. I'm like, uh, and then you get in the car and you can't touch the steering wheel. With the, with a patch, yeah, that is a problem uh, in, in places that are hot and sweaty. And I think, and the delivery of the medication could conceivably be altered by temperature. You know, if the temperature is 110, uh, that could conceivably accelerate or increase the, uh, the medication delivery. Uh, so I, <laughs> my advice would be <laughs> stay inside, stay in the car uh, on those extremely hot days because it, it, it could influence how the patch is adhering, which has been a problem in the past with that. 
medication and also how the medication is being delivered. Okay, Jim and Sheila. Doc says crank the AC. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so there were a couple of questions about uh, Canadian pharmacies. Um, mm -hmm. Drugs can be expensive, so there are, you know, mail order Canadian pharmacy companies. Yeah. Then is, in that case, is it outside of FDA regulations? Do you um, recommend, do you caution against? Any thoughts around that? Well, I think there, the medications that are available in Canada are you know, the Parkinson's medications are the same as they are in the United States. But I don't know about the legality of, of going outside of the United States and having medications delivered by mail, for example. So I'd, I'd have to punt on that one. Okay. We, we, we hit a question that uh, you can't answer <laughs> about that. I know uh, people have done that. I know people have gone to Mexico uh, to get their medications, but I'm not sure how the government here regards that. I have a question. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, doctor, good morning, or good afternoon, I guess, for you. Question, I get drugs mailed to me from Florida, sometimes, okay. sometimes from Phoenix. They sit in my mailbox on occasion for a bunch of hours, and I am in Tucson where it's also quite hot, 110 or so today, for example. Does that affect the pills and the way they are able to work? If it, the heat that is, it might. Yes. So, uh, are you advising, it's, it's, so are you suggesting that maybe I go to my local drugstore instead of doing mail order? I, I would be concerned. Uh, Levodopa, we know, is heat and light sensitive, uh, and I would be somewhat concerned about uh, leaving pills or medication in, the, in a mailbox for a prolonged period of time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Uh, Myra had a question. Do you know, is there a standard amount of time for a medication to move from, move to generic status for that patent to expire? Is it seven or eight years? That's, that number comes to my mind as well, but I think it varies so depending on when the, the patent starts and the the development of the medication until it's released uh, onto the market. So I think it does vary from one drug to another. Okay. Um, I take Nuplazid, which I have to get from a specialty pharmacy. Because it comes from a specialty pharmacy, does that mean it will never go generic? No, that drug will go generic at some point. Uh, I, don't know for sure, but I think New Plaza comes from a specialty pharmacy just so it can be uh, aided uh, in terms of getting it to people. But no, it, it will eventually become generic. I'm certain of that. Okay, very good. Scrolling through the questions. Anyone else? Uh, oh, is it uh, Bonita Hathaway? I think you might have a yes. question. I do have a question. Um, I was started on Resagiline as my first medication. And then my doctor added the uh, carbidopa, levodopa. Uh, recently, I had a message from my insurance company um, that was say, that stated that risagiline and um, carbidopa, levodopa basically work the same way. And what, why would why would I be taking two medications that work the same way? And that was not my understanding when I when the uh, doctor prescribed both of them. Is there a difference in how they act? Uh, absolutely, there is, yes. Yeah. They, they don't work. They are both intended to and <clears throat> approved by the FDA to improve symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but their mechanisms of action are not identical at all. Uh, yes, Resagiline was... serves to block an enzyme that degrades dopamine in the brain. That's how we think it works. And yeah. levodopa, carbidopa, levodopa, levodopa becomes dopamine in the brain trying to replace uh, the uh, reduced amount of dopamine that the brain is making itself. So they're, they're not the same mechanism at all. And in fact, Resagiline has two approvals by the FDA. It's approved as therapy by itself to treat earlier yeah. Parkinson's. And it's also approved as an adjunct to uh, levodopa and other Parkinson's medications. So I'm, I'm, the insurance company baffles me with that statement. Well, I, I said I'm still taking it and 
uh, they didn't say I had to get off of it because doesn't it also help to keep your serotonin and norepinephrine levels up? Well, that, that I don't know for sure. The, the approval, the, you know, the, the mechanism of action is pretty much, we, we think, we don't know for sure, is, is okay. inhibition of the degradation of, her, of uh, dopamine. But I think what they were looking at, there is a cost difference between the two, even in a generic form. Yeah, and unfortunately, so, Resagile has been around for a long time, and it's been yeah. uh, generic for a long time as well. But for some reason, the cost didn't come down a great deal. I know. I when know. it became generic, which is kind of puzzling to me. Yeah. Uh, and levodopa is, you know, it's pretty cheap. It's been around for a long time. Still the best medication for Parkinson's, you know, for some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Well, they let me still get it, so... But I, okay. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, well, I think it reflects sometimes that the, again, I don't want to be overly aggressive and nasty with the insurance companies, but I, I think sometimes they have people who are reviewing these things that are not necessarily experts in the field. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. So if that happens, so it sounds like Bonita just, you know, ignored or found us and asked her question, what should people do if they get that kind of alert from the pharmacy? Call the doctor? I think so. Have a, have a discussion with their physician about it, or, their, or their provider, if they're seeing a nurse practitioner, PA. Um, I think we have a discussion with their provider about this to get some clarity. In this case, it sounds like it was, I'm not sure why they even sent the letter. Maybe they just want to be aware these are both medications that are treat, treatments for Parkinson's disease, but they're not duplicates of one another. Okay. And I think don't take the word of the insurance company that they necessarily, you know, don't assume um, that they always know what they're talking about. Maybe, you know, uh, empower yourself, be an advocate for yourself, you know, yes. check with your, uh, with your provider. Absolutely. Again, I, I don't want to be taking pot shots at anybody, including the insurance companies, because we're you know, really, we're all in this together. We, we, I hope we are anyhow. Um, but again, it, I, I find that's probably the most irksome thing is to get letters like that or denials or we're not, I had, years ago, I had a patient who's got a letter from her insurance company that her levodopa was going to a higher tier. I, mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It's the, the mainstay of Parkinson's therapy and they're, she interpreted that saying they're not going to be covering it anymore, which was uh, just crazy. Absolutely. I think Laura, Laura, do you have more trivia for us? So we'll do Laura and then Judy and then Kathy. Oh, I am trivia master. Um, <laughs> yes. I once was in a conference and the pharmaceuticals explained that the drugs were so expensive because it takes a billion dollars and 10 years to take a medicine from the research to the consumer. Okay, that's why they're so expensive. And then I was in another, in another conference and it takes a musical in Broadway, one billion and 10 years to get from the, from the script to the public. So it, it was just so funny, like it, it's like creating a musical takes lots of resources, but it's a balance between, between many factors. I just wanted to tell you that it's the, how much it, it costs and that a musical is like a medicine, that's hard to develop, just like well, that. You know, I think it's a very good point. And I, I don't want to defend drug prices because I, you know, yeah. One of my patients recently, she doesn't have Parkinson's disease, but she, she's a young woman who has multiple sclerosis. And she is getting a medication which is generic. To, and, and medications for multiple sclerosis do alter the disease progression. So there are now, and have been for some time, so-called disease-modifying therapies. So if you take them earlier, you're likely to do better. So it's, you know, it's really compelling for somebody with uh, multiple sclerosis to use one of these medications. It costs her for a generic medication, her copay is, I think I recall her saying it was $700 a month. And, and this is a person who does not make very much money at all. And that's very heartbreaking and discouraging. Uh, and what can you do about it? I mean, we're trying to find ways, but 
the cost of medication, I think, torments all of us. And I think both sides of the aisle, Republicans, Democrats, often bring this out. But you make a good point. I mean, at the same time, it's a, it's a, it's a gamble. There are good ideas in the lab that look like they're going to be, you know, bear fruit in terms of a therapy. I've done clinical trials for 30 years, and I can't tell you how many that look good in the mice or in the rodents and, and then didn't pan out in people. And, and these pharmaceutical companies invest a lot of time and effort and money uh, with the hope that doesn't always uh, come to pass that this will be successful. That's right, and, but it also makes it so scary to be sick in the United States. I have an uncle in Spain and he's had Parkinson's for 25 years. And he's never, he doesn't pay a cent. Well, you're, you're, DBS, my, yeah. My, my wife is from Europe. Uh, my children live in Europe. And the, you're right. And I get it why this is such a political uh, hot topic in terms of the uh, access to health care and the cost of health care. I see in my work here in Santa Fe, I see people who don't have a lot of means and sometimes don't have access to people who don't have any insurance and they can't necessarily get the kind of treatment I think they should have. And I find that disturbing. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we, we need to, as a society, I, I don't want to preach too much, <laughs> but as a, as a society, we need to make some tough decisions about these kinds of things. Yes, I've seen people, I mean, here in Tampa, there, there's people on the, living in the streets. I met a, people, with, people with Parkinson's who do not have access to them, to it's their tragic. medicine. And they are just treated like if they were junkies, put in jail. And it's just that they are sick, really it's sick. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And I happened to faint the other day. I spent one night in the hospital and it was $32,000. Wow, the Not food must have been very good. No, <laughs> I didn't even, they didn't even give me food. Oh. Well, that's, yeah. uh, I, I understand. It, it, these it's, are issues that are bigger than you and me, but. Uh, it's just it's, scary. Just wanted to transmit my, my feeling of. I get it. In other, in other parts of the world, people are not afraid of getting sick. Right. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. So I'm going to go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go to Judy Reynolds. I think you waved that you had a question next. Oh, well, I actually had a comment um, on the rietary cost. Um, not, excuse me, not rietary, resagilin, sorry. Um, I had my doctor, if you, if you have a good relationship with your doctor, you can do this. Um, I had my doctor write the prescription for twice what I actually take. And so when I get my prescription, it's a 90-day prescription, but it lasts me six months, and I pay the same price. So that's one way to kind of get around the insurance company. Um, I, I think uh, some doctors know about that. Yeah, I, I, I brought it up with my doctor, and he said, fine, you know. It's, it's not a drug I can abuse, so it's not a problem. But um, I, because I was going into the donut hole around September, I ended up in the donut hole and was paying a lot because that drug is very expensive uh, still. Not, well, anyway. So um, that worked out really well for me because I get twice as much and um, I pay the same. You know, it, they write it for. For two two milligrams is cost just as much as a half a milligram when they write mm -hmm. the prescriptions. It's weird, but but that's one way anybody want to try that with their doctor. Uh, and oftentimes the uh, the over you know overarching message of these talks is have a great relationship with your doctor, talk to yep. your doctor, communicate. Yep. Uh, so I think that you know that's another another angle to that. You really, you really have to, like you said, Andrea, advocate for yourself. It's, it's just a, it's a terrible world out there right now for people who are sick. Yes, it is. And I think um, I want to get to all the questions. So I think uh, Marilyn has been waiting. Actually, it's my husband that's been waiting, but 
Um, when we were talking about the cost of drugs, I sort of remember before we went over to Europe for a few years, I read that the cost that they were paying for advertisement was equivalent to or more than the cost that they were putting into research. And I was wondering if Dr. Manowitz knew what the current status of that is for many of the large drug manufacturers. I don't uh, know how that compares to uh, their research and development costs. I see the commercials on television, as everybody else does, uh, which have to cost something. Um, I, again, I don't want to criticize. I mean, for example, years ago, uh, there, there's a disorder which is pretty common, actually, called restless leg syndrome. It is not necessarily connected at all to Parkinson's disease, but some of the Parkinson's medications are used to treat it and have the FDA approval for that purpose. And it, it's pretty common, and it torments people. Uh, uh, severely at, at times, but a lot of doctors were not aware of restless leg syndrome. They thought, oh, you've got insomnia. But uh, a couple of the companies, including uh, GlaxoSmithKline, which was the manufacturer for Requip, did commercials on TV. And it raised awareness in a way that was quite striking for both patients and physicians alike. And since that, that was years ago now, but since those kinds of commercials came on television, uh, I think uh, primary care physicians are more likely to recognize restless leg syndrome and treat it appropriately than they were in the past. So, yeah, you know, maybe there are expenses that could be contained in a different societal structure. I, I, I agree with that. But at the same time, people sometimes uh, aren't aware of therapies that could change their life in a very positive way unless they hear of it somehow by advertising. What would you think? If um, what percentage of the prescriptions that you write are prompted by the patient rather than you, is this something that's rather common? Uh, people inquire about them. Uh, people see th I, you know, I see people with migraine also, and there's a lot of migraine advertising going on these days for some newer medications. So people inquire about them, but I don't think that I prescribe something because of somebody responding to an advertisement, I discuss it with them and try to figure out if it's appropriate for them or not. Thank you. Thanks. And let's see, my favorite screen name so far, Puddles, was unmuted. I don't know if Puddles has a question because you <laughs> remuted yourself. Um, I also see Ron unmuted himself again. Ron, do you have a question? Uh, yes, one of the people in the uh, in the chat mentioned upset stomach with cinnamon, and one thing they can do is take it with uh, a cracker or two. And I also wanted to point out that uh, the pharmaceutical assistance plan helps save the uh, the copay amount as well. Two different topics. Right. Thanks. So some of the companies do have, if if not all, do have, you know, for people who are having a hard time getting their medication. And I, and I have given this feedback to pharmaceutical companies, including in the Parkinson's realm, that if their drug is so expensive and, and the copay is so high, they can't, patients aren't going to get it, what good does it do me or my patients? There has to be some other method. So I think they have taken steps to try to assist people. It's not always easy um, in terms of getting medications that are appropriate for them. Very good. And I think, sorry, scrolling through, um, I see Judy is unmuted. Did you have a question, Judy? I still want to find out about Puddles and why, how that got to be a screen name, but they're back on mute. Okay, so let's see. I'm scrolling through. I don't, we always want to get all of the questions in. Um, let's see. Oh, yes, I see, Ron, the one that you were referring to. Someone asked about Cinemet um, causing nausea. So Ron's idea was to take some, you know, crackers with it. Any, any other advice related to that, Dr. Hermanowitz? I do have a comment about that. So nausea sometimes uh, can be a huge problem with, with, not for most people, but for some, 
uh, especially when they're trying to get on the medication. Uh, it, it, despite the fact that it's combined with carbidopa, they still have nausea. So what I have done sometimes in the past, and I'm not giving specific advice to any individual, this is what I've done in my own practice for some of my patients, is that I put them on carbidopa by itself first. Uh, so it's possible to get carbidopa by itself and pre-treat people, have them take it three times a day uh, for a week or 10 days, and then gradually introduce the carbidopa levodopa. Now, in years ago, the, the nice woman who was talking about the history of Merck, years ago, Merck would provide carbidopa for free. You would just ask them for it and they would send it to you at no cost, carbidopa by itself. It's also called Lodosin is the trade name. I tried to do this recently for a patient um, because she was having some nausea that I thought, well, I'll just tr treat you first with the carbidopa. And she couldn't get the medication because it was going to cost her $700. Um, but that's something that could be done. Or sometimes people use a different anti-nausea medication. Tigan is an old anti-nausea medication that people can use in, in the setting of Parkinson's disease to try to overcome it. Usually when people are on levodopa for a while, that nausea will subside. Okay. And this person commented, it's been two years and it's especially in the morning. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that brings to mind any. But well, so no, it's, you know, it's the first dose of the day, very likely. And you know, you've been up without it uh, overnight, probably. So that is the time when people are more likely to be nauseated. If you're already taking it after breakfast, have your breakfast first, have some food in your stomach, and then take the carbidopa leave it up. If that's still going on, again, I'm not providing specific advice. I have to be careful about that. But if that were if one of my patients whom they have run into this sort of issue, uh, then I would think about maybe a short term of an anti-nausea medication, either that medication I mentioned, uh, Tigan is the trade name for it. There's another one called Zofran or Ondansetron, which is an anti-nausea medication, which is safe in people with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so talk to your doctor about anti-nausea. Yep. Okay, Kathy, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, this is regarding the uh, gentleman who uh, you address, the doctor addressed who uh, leaves his medication in the mailbox and perhaps the heat uh, affects it. And just wondered if the doctor had heard of uh, mail order pharmaceuticals insulating the medications, is that something you, he could ask um, his uh, mail order company? I'm um, not sure if that can be done, but just the thought that they could package it differently. Yeah, I would inquire about that, let them know that you're in a hot place like Tucson. Uh, and I think they would be sensitive to that. They don't want you to take medication that's been rendered ineffective by heat exposure. Is that an idea where maybe sure. something like dry ice would, would work? If there is such a way know, to do it. Uh, along those lines, I just, I had some C's candies, you know, C's chocolates. Right. Uh, I had some delivered to me here in Santa Fe. Uh, and it came packed uh, with insulating material and also some cold thing inside the box. So yeah, if they can do it with C's chocolate, I would think they would do it with medication. Very true. And then my uh, second question that I had was regarding, uh, I think it was Judy's comment that she had uh, doubled the dose for the same price as a single dose of her resetuline, and just um, wondered if perhaps by getting a larger dose, she could also get a better price, you know, which would be, you know, she's getting enough to last six months that she might be able to get a better price because she's getting a higher dose. Yes. My insurance company doesn't have a different rate. Some insurance companies do. So if I get 90 days, it costs me the same per month as if I get one month. So there's no mm. change in mm. cost. No change. But no change. your insurance company. Yeah. Might yeah. So it can be a complex game Thanks. to, first of all, understand <laughs> the tiers and the you know, and the coverages, and then second step is how to use it or maximize it for your own benefit. 
So we're right about at the uh, the end of our session, Dr. Hermanowitz, and I was wondering if you could close us out. You know, uh, I think you've heard the questions and, you know, uh, kind of see where our audience is and, you know, their concerns, <laughs> their, you know, what, uh, what they're worried about and asking about. Um, so just wanted to give you the opportunity to, to have some closing comments to, uh, my, to my, my general thoughts would be that generics are actually a good thing with some caveats. Uh, again, switching from brand to brand for somebody who's very tightly controlled could be uh, problematic. Uh, otherwise, I, you know, some of my patients just sort of have a knee-jerk response that if it's gener generic, it must be bad, which is not the case. My concern more so would be the change of a medication if I were to prescribe a certain medication and, and somebody else, not the FDA, but the insurance company says, no, you must take this instead. And as we've heard, I think a bit, their recommendation is not necessarily based on expertise uh, or the, the uh, well-being of the patient. Their recommendation may be cost-driven. Uh, which I think would, would be an error. Uh, so that I, I want, <clears throat> if that were to occur, as we heard about the resagiline carbidopa levodopa uh, confusion, that would be a reason to discuss that with your uh, treating provider. Okay, absolutely. Well, thank you for educating all of us. Uh, thank you to all of you for your excellent questions, and thanks to Laura for our extra trivia. Now we'll get that Jeopardy question right, maybe. That was um, great. Yes, <laughs> but um, we always like to end our sessions with some uh, some smiles and waves and eye contact. So if you'll join me in waving your gratitude to Dr. Hermanowitz for joining us and, and sharing your time with us on a well, it's it's. it's I'll just say it's been my pleasure, and I really appreciate the comments and the feedback and the uh, interesting points. I learn something every time I do one of these kinds of Absolutely. presentations. Excellent. Yes, TGIF to everyone. And right. yep, Denise wants you to have some green chili for us, non okay. uh, anime <laughs> crowd. So. Will do. Bye, Will everyone. Do. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.